Hi, this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Eric LaMontagne is joining me today as co-host. Hello, Eric. Hello, Pat. Hello. Our guests today are Mary Moulton, who is the CEO of Washington County Mental Health Services, and Michael Hartman, who is also CEO of Lamoille County Mental Health Services. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Um, Hi to both hello. of you. Yes, Mary's been a repeat guest on the show, and Michael, I don't think has, no. although he's had several jobs that I could have tapped into along the way, so we'll, we'll fix that. Um, but anyway, maybe you two can uh, introduce yourselves to our guests, and Michael, I'll start with you. Okay, thank you, Pat and Eric. Uh, uh, Michael Hartman, I am currently, as you said, the uh, Executive Director at Lamoille County Mental Health Services out of Morrisville, covering Lamoille County. And I've been at that for a year, worked there for a few years before that as the director of behavior health. And um, curiously enough, in, in league with my uh, uh, co-presenter here, Mary, uh, was also the commissioner of mental health for four years from 2007 to 2011. Uh, previous to that, worked in mental health. I've actually woke up one day and realized it's been 40 years that I've been working in mental health. So I feel pretty ancient um, <laughs> and probably uh, play out that part from time to time. Um, I have uh, been a crisis worker for oh, probably on some level all of those years, but uh, very specifically for about 15 of them. And uh, also overseeing case management, care management, and uh, psychotherapy services for adults and for children. And so I have a pretty wide breadth of uh, experience in mental health and all of that being in community health, except for the four years that I was uh, working for the uh, state government. Michael, thank you very much for your service. We have to ask you what changes you've seen over the years. We'll get back to you later. <laughs> Mary, could you introduce yourself again to our audience? Absolutely. So Mary Moulton, I'm the executive director at Washington County Mental Health. And Michael and I have walked a similar walk, actually. Um, he actually is a mentor of mine um, and has encouraged me for many years um, when we work together as a crisis worker. Uh, uh, on the Washington County Mental Health uh, Services crisis team. So we, we both worked on the screening team together. Um, and uh, I uh, then um, worked as the director of that team and uh, eventually the chief of operations at Washington County spent some time, little time at the state uh, Department of Mental Health, also as the deputy commissioner and commissioner and um, came back to Washington County Mental Health where I've been the director here for, boy, time flies, but I think it's, uh, I think it's been eight or nine years now already. Really? Eight years. So um, yes, so back here again, and you know, our agency serves the community of Washington County, children through elders, and we are here for all. Thank you. Thank you to your service too, Mary. I'm one of her fans. I'm in the Mary Moulton fan club, so well, we are on as often as we can. Once you know her, you end up in that club. You yeah. <laughs> guys are making me blush now. Oh, yeah. it's true. It's true. That, that's but, what we do on this show, Mary. We do our best to embarrass our guests. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and she's a tough one, so. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you jump in, Eric? And um... Sure. Uh, so we just wrapped up. We're recording this now. It's almost December, but a couple months ago in October was Mental Health Awareness Month, so member uh, organized by the Association of Mental Health. Uh, in the midst of COVID and with everything going on, could you give us a little bit of summary on what that was like for you this year? Sure. That's a big question, it seems like, by your reaction there, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> So how is COVID, Michael? Uh, I, I don't know. I haven't had it yet, Pat. <laughs> yeah, but I've had the test. Don't wish it on anybody. I did, but too. I yeah. That was painful enough. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was going to defer to Mary and, and have her go ahead and start to that. Sure. I, I, think, I think it's been mental health awareness year huh. um, since this That's happened. Right. And I, I think COVID has presented us with unique challenges. It feels like 
responding to people during this virus outbreak is all we do, uh, but we actually are still doing everything else from day to day. And so we are uh, just as a healthcare facility open all the time. We have 24 seven programs. We have residentials and what we had to do was an overlay actually of safety, um, education on personal protective equipment, education for our staff as well as our clients, uh, support of our clients in the community to, um, to be able to isolate and quarantine, to uh, abide by the restrictions that the governor mm -hmm. imposed. Uh, we saw emergency room visits drop. We provided a lot of support in the community so people didn't have to go to the ERs actually during those early stages. Uh, and then, um, you know, as agencies, we have the children that we support in school systems. And so we um, weren't seeing them in schools. So we found ways to see them by dropping food at their homes and checking on them from the doorway. Um, and then for those that we serve who have developmental disabilities and live with home providers, we were uh, doing the same thing, working remotely. Um, turning on telehealth like you wouldn't believe. So going from hardly ever using this Zoom type device for telehealth, seeing everyone face to face to doing thousands and thousands of hours for therapy, for supports, um, as much as we could all the way around. So it has been an incredible lift. I think we have learned a tremendous amount about what works and what doesn't. And I think it's taught us as a community that mental health is for everyone because it affects us all. And we've seen levels of stress in people that uh, are all, all of us together that gives us a huge appreciation for our whole body, our whole self, including our mental health. I just, two questions come to mind, um, Mary. One is, I heard that a lot of people are not going to the ER these days. Why, why is that? Were they just afraid to be around others with, with the COVID? And so you were op opening up your um, places for emergency help? Is that what you well, said? We do, we do emergency support. supports within the community, right? So right. in the early stages of COVID, people were doing what they were asked to do. And that meant that they were taking care of themselves for, and, and not going as they might to the ER for those types of I psychiatric see. support I, I because see, they see. were asked not to. Oh. Right now, I think we're seeing a shift. We're at a different place in time where people waited and perhaps put some things on hold uh, uh, around their needs. And so we are seeing folks going to the ER in spite of the fact that COVID is happening. It is a different time now than it was in the beginning. So it's shifting and changing. And I bet Michael can speak to that. He's yeah. seeing these changes in the moil. So I'll pass the hat. So, uh, I, you know, Mary, uh, I think we, we had a pretty similar experience as Mary describes in terms of the community. So uh, I would turn a little bit to talk about the internal and messaging process, because what what we found when we uh, we in in the second week of March there when everything flipped over, um, both uh, Washington County and Lamoille were part of a, another uh, a group of uh, health agencies okay. that were in the process of becoming uh, joined through a uh, shared resource of a uh, unified electronic medical record. And that had caused us to do a number of IT changes and upgrades. And so really we lucked out that we had just uh, gotten a whole batch of new laptops with cameras and uh, other equipment that allowed us to jump right into doing um, the mental health services via Zoom. Um, <clears throat> and so the transition, as, as she said, was very quick. What was really amazing is how well our staff did at adapting to this uh, medium. Um, I mean, many of them are younger and are used to doing video chats and things like that, but the ability for them to jump into being service providers through this medium was not something that almost any of them had any practice in. 
and we were lucky that we had uh, a psychiatrist, um, Dr. Mark McGee, who had actually come to our agency to start doing services and exclusively through telemedicine. Mm. And so he was able to help give us training um, across all of our programs and actually provide UVM and some other aspects, uh, other service providers in a way to, to get uh, us much more aware of background and noise and other kinds of issues that um, here in my house tonight, I think mm -hmm. you've heard a few things that normally in the office, everything is very quiet, but um, the lighting here in, in my room and uh, other things are not as ideal as I prefer, but um, we, so part of it was getting like, how do we do this whole new piece of doing things through the camera? And then the second part uh, was, how do we also try to support people who are very used to having face-to-face, hands-on right. kinds of assistance suddenly only come through either a uh, uh, computer or through the telephone. And because many of our consumers are folks who live pretty close to the edge economically, a lot of them did not have uh, the kind of equipment that easily uh, adopted itself to being used uh, in this way. So consequently, we also had to purchase uh, a load of, uh, um, of uh, small laptops to have people mm. share. Uh, yeah. We also were quickly had to identify who are the people who, even if you give the and can't use it because Lamoille County is so rural that we have many, many pockets where there's no internet and especially high speed internet. So that actually trying to do Teams or Zoom or those things could be worse under those conditions than mm. it is just talk on the phone. So we identified who we could better serve through the phone and then found that some of them lived in places that didn't have phone service either. <laughs> so wow. We've been, we've been uh, there's been a lot of, of constantly adjusting and moving around how to serve people in a way that makes them feel comfortable yeah. and allows you to still be able to give them the service that they need. I think, you know, one of the other pieces about, about doing the service is that for this kind of um, disaster, um, we have really had to uh, become very familiar with how to help people with anxiety and depression who can't come out to see anybody and are told to stay in their house all the time, which would probably be about the two worst things that you would tell people who are coping with anxiety and depression. Right, right. Um, and so... Uh, having to learn how to engage with folks better. Uh, for instance, uh, there a, a client that I was working with, I was seeing once a week uh, in the field, and I had to move to seeing them twice a week, one time for an hour-long session and video, and then a second time during the week for just 15 to 30 minutes on video. And the same with another person that I was working with where – uh, a lot of people can't put up with an hour of video. Um, mm. That doesn't include executive directors of mental health agencies, because we <laughs> do it for hours and hours. But um, uh, for many consumers, the challenge of being on a Zoom call and trying to do intensive work for more than a half an hour becomes a challenge for some, right. for others. Right. Actually, they've really come to like it. For some people, therapy, especially through Zoom, has been a very, very positive experience for them, which they ha wouldn't have ever realized if it hadn't been for this event. So there have been a mixed bag of good and bad things. But I, I think that, the, the again, the most amazing thing is how much consumers and staff uh, providing services have really worked at kind of scrunching in the chair and finding the sweet spot where they can have pretty close to the kind of relationship that they had before and still be able to, to make progress. We, we have not seen that 
We have an extraordinarily uh, higher number of people who are going to the hospital or needing uh, crisis services so far uh, of the people that we normally serve. What we are seeing is a lot of people that we never saw before. Ah, new people. Crisis, yeah. Uh, so I, I think for you know for people who have long-term mental health issues, they're pretty solid people who kind of are very adaptable and have gone through a lot in their life. Um, but for folks who kind of had things working out pretty well for themselves and suddenly lost their job or can't see right. people, family, can't travel and uh, can't really live life the way that they were living it, it's thrown everything up in the air for them. And probably the single group that that's the most true for of, in, in, from my perspective, are elders, but also uh, parents. I think mm -hmm. that um, it's been extraordinary to see how many, uh, especially single parents, have found themselves being the teacher, the employee, uh, the chief cook and bottle washer, the disciplinarian, uh, for for days on end without uh, any intervention and right. uh, any time away, and be able to do that and still come through it all. It's it's really been quite the uh, quite the amazing thing for some of our folks who have really struggled with uh, holding all those roles in two hands. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot. Oh, I'm sorry, Eric. There's a lot I was thinking about about uh, kids with autism, kids with um, uh, you know struggling with with space and uh, and distance, and to be to be talking to you by Zoom and learning. I just I was just wondering how it all worked out, but it it sounds like it it worked out somehow, whether through intervention from you and Mary and others around the state or just the teachers, because. I was thinking how hard it must be. Change is hard for all of us, me included. And here are these kids who need, oh, I'm sure need some real structure in their life and they don't have it anymore. Oh, those, well, bless you. Those right. folks that um, you're saying are finding that Zoom has actually opened their eyes to the benefits of speaking with mental health professionals. Why is it that you think that this kind of telemedicine format works really well for people who might otherwise, um, you know, have, have avoided going and talking to somebody? Well, I think for the folks that it does work for, it's been, A, they don't have to travel, um, so they can just be right where they are in comfort of their own living room. Um, and uh, also, I think that uh, for many people, it is... Um, it, it it's no longer has any stigma attached to it about going to the mental health office. Um, so it's right. both the intimacy of being at home and being in your comfortable chair, but also not having to go uh, to an office and uh, sit in a waiting room, et cetera. Um, but I, I think that another factor for, for many people is that uh, for I think for some of them, it's it's the intimacy that it feels very focused when you when you're okay. doing therapy on Zoom. Yeah. Um, so that that would be kind of what I've seen in the literature so far about this, and 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 maybe that's one of the features that makes this also really hard is that all of us, uh, Mary and myself and other folks in this work we all are doing things that nobody ever taught anybody to do. So we're, we're constantly trying to figure out, well, why does this work? Why does it work right. this time and it doesn't work that time? And I'm sure Mary has some, some uh, other aspects of uh, the answer to your question as well, Eric. I, I think for our therapists who I've spoken to, Eric, they have indicated that um, they try to take the lead for people. And Michael mentioned this on the time that's comfortable for them to be on the call. So for some, you know, that 50 minute hour that therapists do, or, um, you know, it, it, they folks couldn't, can't manage it very well. So 35 really quality focused minutes works really, really well for them perhaps. And they're able to moderate that. The transportation, I would agree is a huge piece. Um, our no-show rate actually dropped 
people that wow. were not that couldn't make it to their appointments because they couldn't get transport or they were late in their day and they decided forget it now they can just phone in and they can get right hop right onto the call um, during this period of time i think we also looked at some national statistics in february and march and where our overall population was seeing these increases in anxiety and depression you also saw the scripts that doctors were writing go up by looking at what they call express scripts data. So hmm. anti-anxiety medication prescribing went up 34%. Um, wow. You know, and and uh, anti-depression medication prescribing went up 18%. Anti-insomnia medication um, hmm. went up 14%. So, you know, I haven't looked at that data in the last few months, but that was by March, by by April of last year, uh, March and April of last year. So, you know, people are seeing their primary care physicians and um, we are embedded in those offices with primary care physicians. And we're seeing those, um, we're not there for in person. So we're getting those referrals on Zoom and we are hopping okay. on and connecting with people as soon as we can. Excellent. What, what came to my mind when Michael said that was, um, was that I have your undivided attention and that you are, you were paying attention to me as a, as a patient, as a client. And I would, I would like that because uh, when I talk to my daughter, it's just she and I, and, and she's talking to me, I'm talking to her and we're not worried about being at the office with people knocking on the door or phones ringing and I think that must help a lot that they feel that somebody's paying attention to them, um, mm -hmm. you know, because they see your face and you're looking at them and it's just the two of you. That's great. But I wanted to switch a little bit and talk about um, mental health, the mental health system. And I'm going to start out by just talking nationally and how that relates to Vermont. I read a lot about, uh, I, I don't have a life and I read about the treatment advocacy center when I do research for the shows, I come, I find these incredible things. But it's a national nonprofit organization that's dedicated to uh, uh, looking at barriers and trying to overcome them for the treatment of uh, severe mental health, uh, mental health issues. And they're not real kind about our mental health system. Uh, they say the system is dysfunctional from top to bottom, and we need to fix it. So. I just wanted you to talk, each of you to talk about what their view of mental health the system as it relates to the nation and as it relates to here in Vermont. It, it probably depends on their lens, right? So, you know, yeah. as an advocacy center, I'm not sure of what criteria they are applying, but certainly yeah. for, um, you know, being able to access mental health care is extremely important. And in Vermont, we actually have a system, uh, this designated agency system, that's different than other states. So we actually do very well in the area of access. In fact, we are, I believe, rated number one in the nation for access um, by the um, uh, you know, National Association of Mental Health. And that's an, that's an assignment, that number, just in the past few months that came That's out. great. Good that for us. Well, it, it, it doesn't mean we're great. It means we're better than yeah. what this group might be saying. And so we should always strive to be sure that our doors are open. As a designated agency, as anyone in the community come through the door. Our problem is sometimes that we can't get them in immediately. They can go to emergency services, yes, always 24 seven. But for ongoing counseling, it might be a few weeks due to wait lists. And, you know, just similarly, um, as a person needs psychiatric hospitalization, they might have to wait a couple of days for a hospital bed, where if you had a heart attack, you're not waiting a right. couple of days for your med surge bed or your ICU bed. So that's when you get to the disparities between health and mental health. And where organizations, um, as you mentioned, are watching those things. And I think yeah. it's very good that they're watching and they're weighing in um, and they're saying, hey, we need to do better. Access to psychiatric care, to mental health supports um, is extremely important because it is health. Mental yeah. health right. is health care. 
and, we and, should and be that's, able that to just changed a year or two ago, right, Mary? And you were pushing that, that why is mental health in a different committee in the state house? Um, why is it treated differently? And that's, it's a, it's a health issue. Absolutely. And that's our message. And that helps to, I think, um, you know, our, our effort there is to beat down some of the stigma Right. Um, that Michael mentioned around, you know, the Zoom call sometimes works because people don't have to walk in the door of a mental right. health center. Well, right. you know, we also want to say, you know, come in the door. You shouldn't feel right. bad about that. Right. You need that help. We all need that help. COVID-19 is actually teaching us that we all need help from each other, from our experts, um, from our doctors. We need to reach out because it's a health issue. And uh, we all should know a little bit of what that feels like at this point in time. So. Well, I think we have a great experience, and, and you were involved with this, with the opioid crisis and the spoken hub and spoke. Hub and spoke. Is that the hub and spoke? I mean, we, we received national acclaim for that uh, about having one door. You go in one door and, and you get all the services. And, and uh, that's something we should obviously do for mental health. Uh, Michael, do you have any comments on that? Well, um, I do have, uh, I, I'd say, some thoughts about um, the Treatment Advocacy Center um, in terms of uh, it was it, a key player in the development of that organization was E. Fuller Tory, who uh -huh. a doc and uh, who had a family member who had severe mental illness. Uh -huh. And so I think that where he comes from in looking at the mental health system is a pretty bright light that he shines on a lot of things. And I think as Mary uh, very uh, clearly pointed out, part of the challenge is uh, kind of unfortunately where you live makes a difference. And when mm. you live here, um, you have access to a system that's that is very unique in the in the country in terms of access to care, in terms of especially community access to care. Um, and when you live in some other parts of the country, the uh, ability to go to a local mental health provider can really be a pretty challenging experience. A few mm -hmm. years. For instance, in uh, North or South Dakota, I don't remember which one it was. I think it was North. Um, if you wanted to take your child to see a psychiatrist, there were three of them in the state. Mm. And uh, two of them were in one city and one of them was in another city. And if you were in the eastern part of the state, it was a 200 to 300 mile drive to see <laughs> wow. a psychiatrist. Right. And as you can imagine, since there were only three of them, it also meant a long-term wait for yeah, him. wait. And so, rightfully, uh, Tori points out that um, we don't fund mental health. I think, as as you were uh, pointing out, we don't fund it the way that we fund healthcare. We don't right. fund it the way that we have uh, really gone to look at the opiate addiction issue. We don't really say that everybody has an absolute right to mental health services as quickly. Mm other health services. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, the experiences, though, of family members like uh, Dr. To uh, to Dr. Fuller um, and, and uh, Pete Early, who was a reporter for the Washington Post, who wrote a very uh, interesting book about work trying to get his son help in, uh, mm -hmm. in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and the challenges that he faced there, um, <clears throat> those are, are pretty real. They've gotten better in a lot of parts of the country, but it's still really difficult. And I'd say still for, for us doing community level mental health care, um, we still face a lot of hurdles around uh, being able to be funded well enough to pay well enough to mm -hmm. uh, Keep our systems working in a relatively smooth fashion. We're constantly sort of uh, groping with uh, changes in uh, funding streams. Um, we're mm. working the last few years on how to do a payment reform with state government and us being able to uh, get a, a single payment 
for serving a person in a month versus getting paid for the service or fee for service model. Um, and that has moved into developmental services as well. And it's mm -hmm. moved into children's services. In the beginning of the pandemic, that was very helpful to us because we didn't have to think about so much or are we able to bill for these services and make things happen. Uh, we were able to keep doing what we were doing um, oh. and, the, and we got paid. Um, on some other parts though, such as school mental health, where it's still pretty much more like the older system, uh, there were problems in terms of funding uh, being pulled back a little bit because right. we weren't doing it in the traditional way. And again, I, I'd say that Vermont being what it is, we were lucky that you can sit down and have conversations with superintendents and with uh, uh, <clears throat> secretaries of education and explain things and talk about things and come up with solutions, which we had by, by uh, this fall. But I think um, mental health is still a very precariously funded model. There's not the kind of um, support, as Mary was saying, if you are having a complete sort of psychotic break and you're in the emergency room, you could be there for weeks. If you had a heart attack, weeks? Weeks. Um, and it's gotten better, but when I, when I came out of state government, I went into uh, working in, um, in doing some uh, contractual consultation for a company that worked for the uh, health access office of the state and then came back to the community. And in that time period after Irene, after the storm, um, suddenly found that people were waiting for sometimes three to seven weeks to get into Oh, my God. Sorry. And, and, <laughs> well, I think no, that's, I mean, to, to be in that kind of mindset for seven or eight weeks, I mean, how do you even, how do you deal with that? I in an emergency, yeah, not uh, at, not in you know not at home, um, you know, and that all got better over the last uh, years. But it's still periodically we find ourselves hung up with somebody being in an emergency room for a long right. period of time because of COVID. Right now, the number of beds have been yeah. less available because yeah. they couldn't have the same kind of crowding in a yeah. in an inpatient unit. So there's there are a lot of challenges that we've had to cope with that uh, some of them are similar to healthcare in general right now, overtaxed people and not enough resources. But for the most part on the on the community mental health side, those are kind of constant conditions for us. Oh wow. And and the number you were talking about the example of the one doctor in one town and the two in this in the other same town. Do we have enough really good mental health professionals here in Vermont? Or I'm sure we could always use more and, and maybe better, although I'm sure they're wonderful. But um, do we have enough to a terrible incident is coming to mind was the young man who knew he was in trouble and he went to get help and he couldn't get help and he got into his car and I think we all know the results of that and um, it was it because nobody would see him at the time and we have to be on this stuff these people if they're especially if they're asking for help they should know where they're well, at there's there's always 24 7 well, availability exactly. Yeah. And there are always emergency rooms and um, we have a 24 seven crisis line that's that's available. Oh, that's right. For folks to call into. Yeah. And that 24 seven crisis line does a, a support and then assessment as to whether someone needs to be seen face to face. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, the very good news is that throughout the entire state, within all of our designated agencies, there is a core group of services that are provided and that's one of them. So, oh, that's good. Uh, you know, there's a, that availability um, at, for, for our entire community. Anyone can call it at any time. That's great. Mary, if, you're, if somebody calls in and speaks to one of your folks and it's determined that they need that face-to-face -face help, does that, because they went through you first, does that guarantee them quick 
quick access to that help that they need or is there still a barrier between getting the referral from you and them actually getting that face-to-face -face time? Well, we, we are the door, the gate, so to speak. So that's what's different in other states. There aren't six gates. There's one gate and you got it, you come through it. So if you go to the ER, the ER is going to call for us or else they'll manage it if they have their own psychiatry during the day. But most all designated agencies have arrangements to respond mm -hmm. to their hospital, or in fact, all of them do, to their hospital right. emergency. Right. So they will see us and um, upon the clinician doing an assessment, whether they see us in the emergency room or whether now we have mobile units. So we, uh, in both Lamoille and Washington County, our groups could end up getting a call from a police officer and saying, will you please meet me? Um, might be at the police station. It might be out at someone's home. So we go there uh, in our cars. And that's what our teams do. They go out. It might be to a school. When the school calls and says, we have a child who is suicidal, will you please send a screener to come and see them? That's what these teams do. So they're operating, moving all day long to DCF to the courthouse if the judge calls, to the emergency room, um, school mm -hmm. systems, et cetera. So, um, so with that then there's an assessment made and if there's a determination and that a person should be in a hospital for safety reasons, and that, that is the, you know, we wanna go for the most supportive, least restrictive setting, that's our goal. And then if a person needs hospitalization, they go to the emergency room for clearance medically to go forward onto a unit. And that emergency mm -hmm. services worker works to find a bed within our system of care. Um, we have beds throughout the state. We have one state run facility for Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. And then we have psychiatric units throughout the state that are um, attached to other hospitals other than Brattleboro Retreat, which is mm -hmm. standalone. And um, Wyndham Center, which is also standalone. So, um, so it must, it must they, all be they, complicated. They, we then look for a bed for the person. It must That's all right. be complicated, of course, by COVID, because the pe the person comes in an emergency, and you don't know what whether There's he or she has it or doesn't have it. And there have been tricky, tricky scenarios. Uh, that COVID, there have you know, for people might they might have to get a, a test. It's a rapid. Uh, test the rapid right. test is eighty five percent correct. It's uh, uh, you know not the uh, not the full test, but if a person is having to wait for a few days, that result will come back. Yeah. Uh, and there have been times on units where the unit will say we really need to have that result back before we will take the person. Oh, great! Um, right. Particularly if they've been with anyone that might have had symptoms, right. they have to have a test first. Uh, so it's tricky. This COVID yeah. has made movement and flow in the system slower, um, mm. it, whether a person is going into a hospital or whether they're coming back out of a hospital right. where they then have been in an environment with people who have come in from all over the place and yeah. say they have to return to, uh, they live in a home. Well, then we may have yeah. them go stay in our transitional housing space for a few days, get a test, and when that's cleared, um, then they can go back to the group home. So it's, it's really created flow yeah. issues. I think yep. we have done amazingly well as a system, given all the flow issues that are in front of us right now. Well, you feel bad for the patients because they just want consistency, right? They want to know well, that yeah. at seven o'clock they're doing this and nine o'clock they're doing this, and but where is the issue now, right? Yeah. And, you know, Pat, I think one of the things that struck me about what you and uh, were talking with Mary about a few minutes ago is that question of, of folks who become distraught and um, aren't engaged in treatment to start with, um, which is a number of people mm -hmm. who kill themselves. Um, oh. We have a very small uh, portion of those people annually that actually come into contact with mental health uh, services. Yeah. 
majority of people are not engaged in treatment. And, um, it, and so one of the things that we've taken to doing in the last few years is trying to better identify how we can do outreach to people who are in trouble. And I think that's been an aspect of COVID as well, of how do we tune up our senses, so to speak, to really be alert to the kind of signs that might indicate somebody is on the verge of being um, seriously injuring themselves. You know, Interesting. Um, things like uh, uh, we had a, um, a situation in our area recently that caused us to look and say, so one of the things that we could see with this person is that they made a number of visits to their uh, medical provider in uh, months in between two different attempts to kill themselves. Oh. And um, so one of the things that we are looking forward to with our newer um, electronic medical record system is how to engage more with the medical providers in the emergency room and be able to be aware that if we're working with somebody, is there a sudden change in how they're using their medical provider services right. uh, and and uh, some other signs of people being more withdrawn or having difficulty uh, because very often we, we still, I think, mostly related to stigma, we still have a hard time with people easily coming to terms with the idea that they should go and talk to somebody about what their problems are, you know, much... Yep. As much as uh, we've done so many other preventative uh -huh. things, culture, like gotten people to brush their teeth, and uh, if somebody has a chest pain, that they should be going to see their doctor, that um, in, in the mental health side, we still have a ways to go to educate everybody, not just people who have more serious symptoms, but people who have milder symptoms, especially in a time like right now, where those milder symptoms could become more serious kind of unexpectedly. Um, you know, as, as we were talking before we got started here about Thanksgiving and, you know, uh, I haven't, haven't seen, I saw my son for about an hour in August since March. He lived oh. in Boulder. We were able to find neutral ground where we were able to see each other in August, but I haven't seen him since until wow. we did a Zoom the other night because yeah. we just felt like we hadn't seen each other. So normally we would see each other a couple of times a month at least. Right. And here it's been twice in nine months. That's hard. And and sometimes people don't realize how much, you know, as we've gone on you know, with, with uh, this pandemic, how much suddenly people can just feel like I can't do this anymore. Right. I'm so tired of the weather, not being able to go anywhere, um, those kinds of pieces that um, being able to create some easy, easy ways for people to pick up the phone, as yep. Mary was talking about, and call a crisis they worker, help. but just generally helping people learning how to talk about doing mental health first aid and being able to... Um, mm -hmm talk to somebody and help them identify when they are struggling. Wow. Because definitely that's, that's going to be our true success is when we get to the place where we're doing more prevention than treatment. It'll be interesting to see when COVID's over, what we've learned and what we've put in place. Um, when we say we're going back to normal, I think normal's not even going to be what normal is because there, we've Absolutely. learned some stuff from COVID. Yeah. yeah. Eric, you want to take it on from here? Yeah, yeah. One thing I want to want to touch on, and I'm going to do F Pat's favorite thing here and go off script a little bit. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, we've we've touched on this a little bit throughout the last 45 minutes, but it's the idea of that first contact when somebody is having a mental health episode. Where I am in Chittenden County, the big conversation is about um, transferring some funding for law enforcement over to mental health professionals to play that first responder treatments instead of putting that burden on 
somebody who is not trained to address a situation like that with, you know, outside of the bounds of, you know, control, uh, controlling it. So just curious where, just to, yeah, I'd just like to hear both of you kind of speak to that uh, concept of, you know, trying to get more boots on the ground to intercept these situations. You're talking to two old crisis workers who have done this for a long, long time, Eric. Um, in Washington County, 60% of our calls, we don't involve police when we do outreach. And so, you know, sometimes it's 65%. So it's a mobile team that's been used to responding to that for a long time. And the police are used to calling and networking with us um, as a team by just calling our hotline and saying, hey, we have so and so you know, can you meet us there? Or it doesn't seem like we need to go on this, right? Um, we, we also have a worker now in, in um, our region that works between Barrie and Montpelier and shares time mm -hmm. in responding to calls when they come in. So what you're talking about exists in some areas of the state. In fact, the state police uh, will are hoping to have a clinician in most of their um, mm -hmm. most of their barracks in this next year. There's going to be an effort mm -hmm. to shift some of that funding or maybe might one might say find some <laughs> of the funding uh, to be able to have a clinician that's at least one full time within the area. I think it makes a lot of sense when it's safe. I think we are fooling ourselves. And I say this really strongly because I think it's really I hear this strand of conversation about, we just need to send a mental health person out there on this. <laughs> Every single call that comes in, we have to assess safety. And these calls can be, um, these calls can be, uh, we, can, we can work together on some calls if we respond together. And that when we team a lot, um, we learn how to partner to know when to step back and when to step forward. So if it's working really well with the crisis clinician, talking to an individual who is dysregulated, the police officer is there and steps back, right? If it isn't and it becomes a safety issue, the police officer is there to step forward. And so you want to be safe. That's key. If we just send out mental health workers, I don't wear a flak jacket. When I go out and I do remember back in the day, many, many years ago, 30 years ago, um, you know, police would have us go all the time first um, in dangerous situations. Wow. I'm very thankful they don't do that anymore. Um, they really are very careful with protocols and making sure there is uh, safety. But I do think that we, we, we have in our region in Washington County and we can do better to mitigate so many situations that police don't need to be involved in or else we can take it down if we're working with them and we can free them up within a short period. You can come out together and some research will show you when you do a crisis team model with police that one of the results of that model is that police are freed up much more quickly to leave the scene. So if you can go out and secure um, the setting and just make sure, this is just going to be a conversation. We're going to be able to sit down, talk about what's needed, get follow-up. We can let that officer go. We do not need to have that officer on the scene. So the more we can work together or we can shift some dollars to pay for mental health clinicians to work on this model, that some of us have had in play for 50 years at Washington County Mental Health. You hear about this model like it's new. It's not new. We just haven't talked about it a lot. So in my, where Michael and I grew up, that's what we did. That's is this what like we did. A, Mary, is this like the Team 2 concept that we it's talked about? Two. It's Team yeah. 2? Yeah. This, is, this is Team 2, and Team 2 yeah. really came, as, came about as a result of the work that had been done um, you know, in Washington County and in Lamoille right. County that consistently had an outreach team. Um, and many of the designated agencies, because of budgetary cuts, had lost some of their mobile capacity. But we put that back in place with Team 2. Good, and good. It's grown now, and I think it's terrific. So Yeah, because the chief of police of um, Montpelier, the new chief, I spoke to him briefly, and I actually mentioned Team 2. 
and he's coming on the show in a week or two and I'm that's going to be one of the topics about how do we deal with that because you said they they train together too and they know each other so when they get to the scene they know they know each other and, that's and there's right. a real team concept that's built which is seems to me really the way to go yeah, that's good you know, and I and I think that it's it, that is a um, you know as Mary said we've been kind of just quietly doing it for many many years right. uh, in Washington County and but you know there are some other models that are also emerged that similarly just kind of happened someplace Eugene Oregon has a very fascinating program called the White Bird Clinic. And it started off very similar. It started working with the police and it has been funded well enough that it actually has now has a nurse who can do both psychiatry and um, medical care, a mental health worker. Um, the mental health system is tied into the 911 system mm -hmm. so that if somebody's calling and talking about a mental health concern, that can immediately go right to the mental health folks there uh, so that now the officers and uh, first responders for medical care and first responders for mental health are all intertwined in that uh, in that community right. and have a very low rate of uh, problems with the police or the police with the mental health or the mental health folks with That's the great. That's great. Michael, you mentioned before, I wanted to bring this up about tragedies. And I read about this thing called the Preventable Tragedies da Database, which I think you might have been referring to. Um, it's it's a role of, of, I mean, it's a way of keeping track of tragedies and, and analyzing how they could have been prevented. The, the one issue they talked about is that it's incomplete because of suicides and they're not getting as many uh, as much input on suicides as as possible um so um i don't know you've talked about data gathering in vermont i know mary has but where are we with with that are we uh well there actually, somewhere i hope i was just involved with a very interesting process with the attorney general's office oh good we uh, Memorial county was one of the first counties uh mental health services to work uh, in with the um, committee that's been formed to look at preventable uh, tragedies Great. for persons with disabilities. Great. Great. And, uh, adults. And, you know, that process was one uh, where um, we had a death of a person by natural causes. And um, what happened is that through the Department of Aging and Independent Living, through the, um, the Attorney General's office, through the local coroner's office, through the uh, state coroner, through uh, the Department of Mental Health, or of Health rather, all these forces kind of came and reviewed all the facts that were about that situation, and then brought in at the end of its process providers, including us, um, to talk about what we had learned from this process and to share with them what we saw as uh, things that the system might be able to change. And I think that that's um, mm -hmm. of a movement that started a little while back mm -hmm. about doctors being able to apologize to patients when medical things happen and that that has really grown now to a place where people could actually look at those kinds of bad outcomes uh, wow. in situations and really analyze them and figure out not so much who's to blame and uh, I mean sometimes that's important too but also what could be different and Great. You know, as part of um, the work that we are doing now in Zero Suicide, which is a community effort to reduce suicide, is really to do that, educating people about what, um, what are the kind of signs of problems, um, all the way down to helping systems respond better to people who may be at risk. So I think we're 
in many ways, we're making some huge strides in, in our state, especially, uh, to look at all kinds of health and specifically in mental health, how we can do things that really lessen the chances of a bad outcome. I bet the, uh, I'm gonna I uh, cut you off here. We're at about two minutes left. Ah, we are. Um, time really does fly during these things, so I want to make sure that everybody gets, uh, you know, that Mary and Michael, you both get a, you know, a six quick sixty second wrap up statement here before we have to call it. Mary, you want to go ahead? Sure, sure. Well, again, just thanks for the opportunity to come and talk about this. I think, um, you know, for <clears throat> Our message to the community, we just um, we just want folks to know that um, that we're here and um, we have a 24 seven availability uh, that is uh, is here for our community. So, um, you know, the one place that we didn't talk and I always like to mention um, is folks who have developmental and intellectual disabilities. And we didn't, we didn't get into that at all today, but we serve people um, that uh, in, within that population and they have experienced, I just want to stress uh, also considerable mental health issues during this time and their vulnerability is considerably high. So, hmm. um, you know, we, we want to, um, we, we have been available to those folks, of course, through our system, but it has really accentuated for us all the things that Michael's brought out about, um, about needs for people who are more I, vulnerable. So, I, um, so no, it doesn't matter your disability or not. We, uh, we're, we're here for the community. Right. That's Thank great, Mary. Thank you. Michael? And I'm, I'm going to endorse everything that my dear colleague just just said. I, I think, um, you know, there, the more we try to um, expand what we do and understand the different populations we serve, almost invariably, the more we find that it's a real balance of hearing what uh, consumers of services have to say about their experience of receiving services or what we might be able to do better and how we continue to try to apply and have an interactive relationship with people that will eventually help us to, to serve more and more people earlier and earlier in the processes that they might have needing help. And, you know, because when you meet somebody, especially I think in the, on the developmental services side of the equation, and you find someone who for their life has been sort of locked in, unable to communicate, unable to really express what they think, and you see that door get flung open and hear what they have to say, that you okay. realize you've been observing everything in, in the world and have a really interesting perspective on it. So it's, it's a great thing that you guys are putting together this kind of show on a community level to have these conversations. Oh, thank you. We've had some great feedback uh, on the stuff that we've talked about. And we want to thank you both. Uh, and Mary knows anytime you have something to chat about and you want to get it out, let us know. Eric, right, thank you for um, uh, hosting with me. I appreciate it. And this was a great show. Thank you both very much. And thank you for everything you do for your communities. Thank uh, thanks you for so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Anytime. Um, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. In the meantime, keep listening beyond the sound bites.